Few things are as scary as not being able to breathe properly. We need oxygen to live, and a lot of it. Problems breathing tonight on call with the Prairie Doc. Good evening and welcome to On Call with the Prairie Doc. Most of the time we breathe without giving it a thought. I mean, it comes right to our attention when there's a problem. First, let's take a look at this week's Prairie Doc quiz question. True or false this week? The risk of bacterial pneumonia can be quickly and effectively reduced by getting a flu or viral flu vaccination. True or false? Viewers who call in the correct answer will be entered into a drawing to win a signed copy of our book, The Picture of Health. Each of my essays originally written for this show comes with a wonderful accompanying photograph by Dr. Judith Peterson. We will announce the answer and the winner at the end of the show. Remember, you only have 10 minutes to get your answer in, but we answer your questions throughout the night with about breathing as they're called in or sent to us via Facebook or email. Call in questions to 1-888-376-6225 or send us an email to the address on the screen. Joining us tonight is Dr. Michael Pietala of the Yankton Medical Clinic. Thank you, Michael, for joining us. Thanks for having me here, Rick. You know, it's such a joy. This is like your fifth I think, is it? I think it's the fifth time. I, you know, I've, I've learned through the years that if you want a good show, you start with a really good guest. <laughs> well, thanks. And then you go from there. But uh, this is pulmonary medicine is your, the name of your game. Yep. Tell me a little bit about how the, you got into that and, sure. and what is pulmonary medicine to you? Yeah, so pulmonology is the specialty of taking care of patients' lungs, um, their breathing, their airway. It's a subspecialty of general internal medicine, um, which I am at heart an internist and a pulmonologist next. Yes. Part of being a pulmonologist is being a critical care physician as well, so yes. uh, manage patients in the intensive care unit. Um, and we do sleep medicine um, in pulmonology, um, obstructive sleep apnea, insomnia, other forms of disrupted sleep. But primarily I take care of patients who have lung problems, either chronic things like asthma and COPD, patients who have lung cancer, um, and sometimes acute illnesses, someone with a pneumonia or influenza. Um, and then, of course, I do general medicine too, so I take care of patients for their have other else. issues. Yeah, from high blood pressure to diabetes. And well, I mean, you look at those. the geriatric population, they don't just have one, one condition. You, they need a pulmonologist and a general internist mm -hmm. who has a broad spectrum. Yeah. And I do that at the Yankton Medical Clinic um, in Yankton, South Dakota. It's my 15th year there. Um, previous to that, I went to South Dakota State and then to the University of South Dakota, and I did my training um, in Rochester, Minnesota at the Mayo Clinic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But you began your football career from where? Hamlin High School. Hamlin High School. Yeah, did you so play football? I, I just did. Asked. Yeah, I but thought we had a really good football team. I didn't my first, uh, my, my, I, my freshman, sophomore, junior <laughs> year, but then they talked me into my senior year and we won a state championship. And wow. Yeah, we had three in a row there with um, Arlen Lickness, who was then the coach at Yankton High School yeah. when I moved to Yankton. So. Is he, is he related to Clark Lickness? I don't think they're related. Arlen's from Britain. You know, Clark was a you know, Watertown was, boy. Yeah, he's still there. And his son, Micah, is one of our ear, nose, and throat surgeons at the Yankton Medical Clinic. Oh, really? Clinic. I knew yeah. there, that he was getting into medicine. Yeah, Dave Abbott and Micah Lickness with the Yankton Medical Clinic ENT. Wow. Dave so. Abbott related to Jim? He's from Yankton, but I don't know that he's, I don't think he's related to Jim. Yeah. <laughs> so. We uh, hats off to dear friend Jim Abbott, who retired as the president of uh, yeah, USD. USD. Kind of hard to beat an old buddy that you grew up, went to college with. Yeah. and. And he's, he was the pre very successful president. And a great um, Yankton resident. He lived in Yankton? Yeah, Jim did. Oh. Uh -huh. Yeah. So uh, let's talk about uh, general topics for pulmonary. Mm -hmm. I mean, you deal with everything. I mean, you've already pointed that out. Mm -hmm. What would be probably the most important issue that could be and, and should be shared? Well, so as a pulmonologist, uh, the bulk of my 
patients, maybe shouldn't say bulk, are smokers or former smokers who've developed chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. I see that on a daily basis. Um, and so the importance of smoking uh, avoidance or smoking cessation is, is critical to my Huge. practice. Um, if you look at patients, you talked about older patients having multiple comorbidities. If they have COPD in addition to high blood pressure or diabetes, the cost to care for them is substantially greater and their, uh, their illnesses are that much more severe because their lungs are impaired at baseline. So a large part of what I do is trying to help patients um, stop smoking and yeah. educate our community, um, our state, um, about the importance of avoidance of nicotine addiction and smoking. Um, and so that's a big part of what I do. Um, and then treating um, COPD, which is uh, you know, a lot about managing your diet and your activity level and your weight, um, in addition to certain medications. Now there's a lot of farming mm -hmm. people that also come to Yankton, I'm sure, and mm -hmm. came to me in Brookings and so on and so forth. Many of them have an exposure to hog dust and farmer's dust and so on and so forth. There's a lot written about the different kinds of farmer's lung. Sure. Could you kind of go over that? Yeah, I can comment on that. So if you don't get a chronic lung disease from smoking, the next most likely thing is your occupation. And as it pertains to occupations in the Midwest, farming would be you know, a common one and one of the bigger risk factors for exposure to particulate matter, um, thermophilic bacteria in the soils, and, and you can develop in some Thermo instances. Thermophilic meaning uh, the heat. Yeah, they just they, they live in the soils, and you can have a, a, a an allergic reaction over time to exposure to them. So it's not the actual dust particles necessarily or or particulate matter settling in your lungs. It's the way your lungs respond it's to that the exposure. Response. Yeah, and so you get this long-standing chronic infla inflammatory change that that sort of compounds over time and so you're not necessarily acutely <coughs> ill um, but you know 30 Chronically. years into farming you've got a dry cough and you're short of breath walking you, know, you get a chest x-ray and it's just you, filled you get a chest x-ray i listen to your lungs and i hear crackles and see shadows that indicate um, chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis um, or allergic alveolitis big words for farmers lung yeah um, you know, a lot of times if you're a smoker, uh, you could get mislabeled as having COPD when you have farmer's lung or vice versa. Yeah. Um, and so smoking compounds all of that, but, um, but we do see a, a fair share of those. And if you have asthma um, or another uh, harder lung condition and get exposed to hog dust in excessive amounts or farm dust, um, that makes it worse as well. I, I, uh, I remember one trip to uh, uh, Missouri where my uh, mom's family were. And so we lived, we, we went to Missouri every time we, it was Christmas. And so uh, I'm, my sister and I were digging around in the back seat of an old car that was dirty and you know, and we pulled out the seat, you know, and of course, yeah. dust filled the air and then I came down with asthma. Yeah. First time uh, I did and it was pretty yeah. tough. Yeah, and so there is, uh, there is an acute hypersensitivity reaction that can occur sometimes with exposure to things like mold or dust, and that's more of a, of an, a, rap, a rapid illness where you're immediately short of breath and you might spike a fever and, and cough and your oxygen levels can drop, um, and that's different than chronic hypersensitivity. Um, and then there are, there's a condition known as reactive airways dysfunction syndrome, RADS, um, that looks a lot like asthma, but it's due to an exposure oh. um, and an injury to the lungs. You know, true asthma is an inflammatory and allergic disease um, driven by eosinophils and IgE and, and you know. Um, it's a complicated It's, it's complicated and it's present usually from birth and you know manifests in different ways throughout your lifetime. Um, sometimes people develop asthma as adults too, um, but, um, but you're generally born with a tendency towards that. Inhaled steroids really helps uh, yeah. asthmatics. So when we're talking about asthma, it's all about steroids um, and the eosinophil. So asthma, the foundation of treatment are inhaled steroids. If we shift over to COPD, which again is a different disease than asthma, asthmatics can develop COPD, but COPD from smoking is a different disease. There we talk about bronchodilators, not steroids. Yeah, I mean, the, the complicated story of lung disease was your highlight at the 
the yearly internal medicine meeting. It was just the best lecture. Yeah, I put it as the Boy, that's a good lecture. It finally <laughs> clarified mm -hmm. uh, some things that are changing. Yeah, know. yeah, major changes, and we can really manage COPD a lot better than we used to. And so, if you have the condition um, and you haven't seen a pulmonologist, I think it's worthwhile. Right. Your symptoms can yeah. can be improved with some of the latest medicines and pulmonary rehabilitation and those things. I have a question that has been bugging me for 15, 20, 30 years, and that is, do asthmatics eventually turn into COPD? Or? Yeah, so the natural progression of the inflammation, so the interstitial inflammation, your airway has a lining and if it gets inflamed, the smooth muscle that surrounds your airway gets stronger than it should be. It hypertrophies and it, and it can squeeze your airway down and that can become permanent if you don't treat your asthma. And so um, patients who either just haven't noticed their symptoms are severe enough or who don't take their medicines appropriately or avoid potential triggers or can avoid develop, the doctor. Yeah, or just don't go to the doctor, can develop COPD. So it's important um, if, you, if it's necessary to be on your asthma medicines even when you're not symptomatic. So in other words, the goal in asthma is to prevent symptoms, not to treat symptoms. Right. You want to avoid them. And so that's where your maintenance inhalers and steroids come in. Sometimes a patient will say, I haven't been using my inhaler because I've been feeling okay. good. But that's not appropriate a good in a persistent asthmatic. No. They need to no. be on their maintenance People meds. People who are asthmatic stay on your maintenance medicine. I mean, that's a very important mes it message. It is. Um, before we go any further, and we've got some questions, thank you for those. Um, we're worrying about coronavirus, and that's a significant risk coming. Yeah. Uh, but we're not fussing so much about the influenza. Yeah. Now, what's the difference between the death rates of the coronavirus and the death rates from influenza? So I think I have a graphic um, that Ginger may want to put up regarding uh, the number of influenza cases um, over the last eight or ten years um, and the number of deaths, um, hospitalizations and deaths yeah. from influenza. I think if you look at this season, and I, I could pull up the CDC's website, yeah, there's, there it is. there's that. And, and if you blow that up, I mean, it's hard to see it, but but the, the incidence is, you know, 40 to 60 million cases of influenza. Um, sorry, I want to get it right. 40 to 60,000 cases of influenza. No, it's more than that. 400. Yeah, I've got it here on my phone too. Give me one second. But it's a lot. It's a lot. So far this year. Oh, here we got it. If you look, yeah, good. Hot, so, 15 million to, to 20. 21 million flu cases from October through January of this year. 7, 700,000 to 10. 7 million to 10 million flu medical visits, 140,000 to 250,000 flu associated hospitalizations, and 8,200 to 20,000 flu deaths. That's just this flu season, okay? Just this flu season. If you look at the latest numbers on the coronavirus, I peaked at them this afternoon, somewhere around 7,000 cases now, six in the United States, and 170 deaths. Um, and so, um, you know, Influenza is as deadly as it is, even though we vaccinate. You know, the biggest risk with the coronavirus is it's highly contagious, like the flu. There is no vaccine for it. And it's important to recognize, too, this is a novel form of the coronavirus, the Wuhan uh, province coronavirus. The, the, one of the most common causes of the common cold is coronavirus, right? Yeah. Rhinovirus coronavirus, or the enteroviruses. That stuffy nose you yeah, get that stuff you know we all get all the kids yep. go back to or school. that you see in the office. And that is, you know, I have an ICU patient who had a positive coronavirus serology and my nurses were nervous. Yeah. And I just had to reassure them. You know, but it's just the common it's a cold. Common cold. That's that type of coronavirus. It's not the novel coronavirus. Yeah. Um, and and again, the majority of people who get this new coronavirus are going to have a five to seven day carousal um, of a common cold like illness, and they're going to be fine. Yeah. But um, you know, right now it looks like 170 out of 7,000 plus die um, from acute respiratory or adult respiratory distress syndrome, a severe. Uh, inflammatory change in the lung. It's not an infection, it's a response to the infection. Yeah. So virus. Well, yeah. those are good. So we have some questions. Okay. Mike. An email viewer asked, how do you diagnose someone with COPD without tests 
And could an inhaler be making a person's respiratory status worse mm -hmm. and causing the thick yellow and green sputum and horrible cough? And what all is thrown under the category of COPD? So is a four-part question. question. No, that's a great question. So chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD, COPD. I mean, is a combination, if you define it strictly, it's a combination of emphysema, which is true destruction of the lung tissue, and chronic bronchitis, which are the symptoms, cough and shortness of breath. Strictly defined, it's cough productive of sputum, uh, lasting two months, occurring at least three times over two years. But long and short of it is, if you've got risk factors, like you're a smoker or a farmer, or you work around particulate matter or dust, and you have a persistent cough or shortness of breath with activity, you're at risk. And um, most important things to talk to your doctor about your symptoms. The the best and most effective way of diagnosing COPD is with pulmonary function testing spirometry, which is available at the Yankton Clinic every day. And um, at the Brookings Clinic. Yep, Brookings, Brookings has Hospital. it. It's a pretty, yep. it's a pretty available test, and, and it's covered by insurance usually, and that can tell us not only if you have the disease, but what the severity of your disease is. So based upon whether you're mild or moderate or severe or very severe, then we select the right medications, now removing you from exposures is a huge part of that. Um, I think there was a question, can my inhaler make things worse? Yeah. Um, I'm not saying it can't, but I would suspect it's not the inhaler causing mm -hmm. things to be worse, it's the disease process itself. And so I think the best thing you can do is just talk to your doctor about it and make sure you're on the right stuff. The inhalers won't make th yellow, thick, green spin. No, if anything, they'll reduce that. You know, the functionality of the muscarinic antagonists, those are the inhalers the that we use. Yeah, ipratropium and now uh, revavenicid and teotropium, spireva and incruse is they're, they're muscarinic antagonists or anticholinergics. They reduce mucus production. Yeah. Um, they don't increase it. Um, and part of the problem in chronic obstructive pulmonary disease is that airway secretes too much mucus. Yeah. And that's what leads to the cough and the sputum production. So the inhaler, if it's the right one, should, should be helping. Helping. The caller from Castlewood asks, just been diagnosed COPD, is there any hope or medicine that can relieve? Absolutely, and so we've had great advances in the ability to treat COPD since putting such a big focus on it through the global initiative on lung disease, GOLD, G-O-L-D, um, and people can go online to the GOLD website and see all sorts of information available. So if you're smoking with COPD, the number one thing is to stop smoking. Um, that will make a big difference. Um, immediately. 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 Um, if you have uh, obstructive lung disease, if it's truly COPD, being on an inhaled um, bronchodilator, usually a long-acting muscarinic antagonist, will improve your symptoms. So two, two inhalers. Can be two, can be one. It just depends on your severity. Um, um, that reduces incidences of exacerbation, keeps you s healthy or, or from being more sick, um, and improves your quality of life. Um, and so stopping smoking first, and then next being on the right inhalers. And then pulmonary rehabilitation is, is highly beneficial, and we're working more and more on getting that at home. You know, have someone instruct you through your smartphone or your iPad. I, I see that coming in the near future. Well, that, um, or going to a facility. Exercise. Yep, it's just exercising and, and it's invaluable. Um, patients with chronic disease who stop being active mm -hmm. are much sicker they than get those weaker who weaker and yep. weaker. And so one of the most important parts of having COPD is making yourself short of breath. <laughs> you gotta get out and move. It's uncomfortable, but it's necessary. Um, and then finally if oxygen's indicated it's a beneficial thing. Um, it, it's only indicated in certain cases. You gotta get there, oxygen levels lower. You gotta have low oxygen either at rest or when you're sleeping, um, not just when you drop. If you're active and it drops, that's not necessarily an indication. But so those things, if you're smoking, stop, get on the right medicines based on the severity of your disease, stay active. Wow. Being able to measure just how much air you are able to breathe is an important part of being able to diagnose a problem. They lose all that elasticity to get air out. So when they're breathing out, even though like you got, like in three seconds, you dumped all the air out of your lungs. So they'll go, <sighs> nine, 10 seconds, 11 seconds, air is still coming out, 12 seconds, air is still coming out. And that's giving me maximum effort. It's very consistent, just like it's supposed to be. It just takes them forever to get the air out. Where for most of my younger patients, um, they just boom, the air is just out right away because they, they're young and the, the, there's no damage to the lung. 
Put your hands just on your cheeks so they don't puff up. Go a little higher. There you go. I'm going to get you started in a nice pattern. Here we go. In, out. 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 All the way in. And all the way out. Keep blowing, keep blowing, keep blowing, keep blowing, keep blowing, blow, 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 big breath in. Good. So what I learned from this test is a couple different things. Um, there's raw airway resistance. So it's kind of looking at how turbulent, let's say that you had like, um, gosh forbid, somebody had a tumor inside their airway or some kind of airway restriction as it was coming through there. So we could see that resistance as air flows through there. That's when you're doing that nice in and out. It's looking for the how well the air kind of flows in and out. And so it's looking at pressure changes out here, kind of like a, like a speaker would be almost. Pressure changes in here, pressure changes outside, and it can measure how much air is left inside your lungs after you breathe out. Hear the word obstruction? They're thinking that there must be something in the airway. Technically, it's about obstructing the air getting out. This is your program, and your questions are key to the direction of our discussion. Please call in your questions to 1-888-376-6225, or send us an email to ask at prairiedoc.org. You know, it makes it a bitter show. So pick up that phone and give us a call. Um, so that, that was quite interesting. I mean, the pulmonary function test, you right. want to make sure they do it right. Yep, you got to have a good pulmonary function test to know exactly what the lung function is. And we use pulmonary function testing in the differential diagnosis of shortness of breath every day, not just for COPD purposes, for asthma and for restrictive lung diseases, scarring of the lung, that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. And the test isn't of any value if it's not done um, the right way. And um, it's not an easy test to do. When patients, I get them prepped for their breathing test, I tell them, give us all your effort every time and it'll be well yeah, worth it in the end. Um, and yeah. so, and the respiratory therapists are invaluable. They and that's a good one. That's that's and, that's, and that's what they do every day. Is they they do breathing tests and they help patients with lung disease. Um, they're in the hospital. They're at the clinic. Yeah, they're great. It's great. A man in his fifties from Rapid City had surgery on a foot fracture on the sixteenth, and the day after surgery had upper right chest pain. He's been to urgent care and other docs that have done x-rays and checked for pulmonary embolism with no findings. Still has constant upper right chest pain that worsens with deep breathing or coughs. Yeah. What do you think that is? Well, you know, so when we talk about pleurisy, um, the definition of pleurisy is it hurts when I take a deep breath or when right. I cough. It's the lining of the lung. Yeah, so our, lung, our lungs are like a couple of balloons hanging in our rigid chest cavity and, and they have a surface on the lung and then on the inside of the chest cavity that um, is called pleura so the lung can move within the chest. And if that becomes inflamed, it will cause his symptoms. So I, I don't know if he was placed on a ventilator when they did the foot surgery. If he was, my suspicion is that there's been some irritation. Um, maybe the, has a consequence of the intubation yeah. of being on the ventilator or something else. Or um, oftentimes diaphragm irritation will cause pain up in the shoulder because yeah. of the phrenic nerve, the way that it innervates the diaphragm, C3, 4, and 5. Yeah. Um, that can become irritated and can lead to pain in the shoulder. Um, I actually saw a guy with a gallbladder problem whose main complaint was shoulder pain because yeah. it was irritating his diaphragm. So I'd look at, at the diaphragm or I would treat for pleurisy in this setting. And, and I'm glad that they said they ruled out pulmonary embolism. Yeah, I think. that was an important. It's gotta be a consideration after yeah. a surgery because that's an increased risk so for I'm, blood clot. Just a little ibuprofen maybe might be Yeah, you could just use some ibuprofen, take you know three or four ibuprofen tablets three or four times a day with food for three or five days, three to five days. And if the symptom goes away, that's what it was. Yeah. Uh, we have a question uh, from Spearfish and she, he, she states, my 95-year-old mother has been living with pulmonary fibrosis. Mm -hmm. 
That's a great, great, great question. My question is whether or not this condition is hereditary. <laughs> yeah, so interestingly, pulmonary fibrosis, there's a lot of different forms of pulmonary fibrosis, and the most important thing is to distinguish whether her mother suffers from something called idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis or whether it's another form of pulmonary fibrosis. If it's idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, um, it's a great word, idiopathic. Yeah, idiopathic. We don't know why it happens. Right. Um, and there can be associations genetically um, or inherited. Uh, so if you have a family member with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, which is pathologically, it's called usual interstitial pneumonitis, UIP. I've uh, never uh, been able to sort those. <laughs> I would be happy. It's, I can teach it to you in, in minutes. Oh. Um, but. But the key is to differentiate whether it's idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Most 95-year-olds don't have idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. They just have scarring from being 95 years old. Yeah, that's um, what it so is. So I would suspect, because most, most of the time, if it's the fatal form of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, IPF, you're younger. You're in your yeah. 60s, maybe even younger than that. So I doubt that there's any Anything. concern in this setting. And not an inherited problem. Not in this setting. Uh, pulmonary fibrosis. You know, in a broad scope, maybe a brush uh, one sentence about what pulmonary fibrosis Yeah, so you got to determine is it this idiopathic disease, because that's a much more serious condition. It's fatal in most instances and is best treated with um, lung transplant. Um, there are now antifibrotic medications Ooh. that can slow the progress. But the vast majority of pulmonary fibrosis is not IPF. It's related to other diseases or exposures. Um, you know, a patient who has rheumatoid arthritis will get sometimes idiopathic, idiop or, will get well, pulmonary, pulmonary fibrosis, fibrosis, not idiopathically. It's associated with their connective tissue disease. Or certain medicines can cause um, fibrotic lung disease, yeah. exposures at work. And so it's all about talking to the pulmonologist about your history, work and home and medications and family history and your own personal history. So you get fibrosis when you're younger. That's a tougher That's diagnosis. a tougher disease if it's not associated with another condition and it's idiopathic. That's that's a tough a lung one. transplant. That's what yep, we're you're, talking. You got to be thinking about it anyways. Caller from Sioux Falls is wondering if the doctors could discuss a little bit about alpha-1 antitrypsin mm -hmm. deficiency as it's related to breathing problems and COPD. Yeah, so alpha-1 antitrypsin is an enzyme that we normally have in our lungs. It's elsewhere in our body too, um, to get rid of free radicals um, that... Toxins. Yeah, toxins that harm the lung tissue. Because we're always breathing in pollution. Crap. Every day, all the time. And some people are deficient in that enzyme, and it's the ones who uh, are completely deficient that develop uh, emphysema at an early age, especially if they smoke. And they get a much more aggressive and much more severe form of emphysema. Now, it's an autosomal recessive disease, so you have to get the gene from both your parents. So um, just because your one parent has alpha-1 antitrypsin doesn't mean you're going to have the disease. Um, but your parents could both be carriers and not have any lung disease, and then you get the two the bad genes, and then you have the disease. So if you have a family member who has emphysema at an early age, you should be tested. The test is free. Um, and so if you go to your doctor and say, uh, you know, I've had some breathing problems. My brother had emphysema at 42. Um, it's worth screening you for alpha-1. And some would say everybody should be screened for alpha-1. I would say, though, that the treatment which is not great mm -hmm. and doesn't really well, replacement? make replacement? Yeah, so, so um, replacement with the alpha-1 enzyme is expensive. Um, and if you look at the, the well-done studies, it may not be of any benefit. Right, so our treatment is crappy, yeah. right? Yeah. And so why do you think that alpha-1 antitrypsin test is for free? Yeah, because they want you on the drugs. The pharmaceutical yeah. industry is Right, promoting. but what I use it for is to make that patient aware of their risk, and they have to really strictly avoid anything that's going to harm their lungs. That's where it's more important to me than oh, trying to prescribe a, 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 a drug a that replacement. is yep. very or, expensive and maybe helps. Or to get them towards transplant again. You know, lung yeah. transplantation has come a long way. I agree. A caller from Sioux Falls is wondering if the... Oh, yeah, email viewer asks, what are the most common triggers for breathing problems indoors during the winter? Yeah, so some patients, you know, we talk about allergies and its relation to asthma and breathing problems. Um, 
some patients, you know, typically allergies are a spring or a fall thing, right? The tree pollens and grass pollens of the spring or the weed pollens of the fall. But some patients are worse in the winter because they have indoor allergies. And those indoor allergies are typically to dust mites. Um, but it can be, you know, anything that's in the house. But usually it's a dust mite allergy when you have Really? Indoor. Dust mites? Yep, dust mites. And you can't escape them. No, they're, they're always there. But you can reduce them, can't you? You can, yeah. You can do things like get rid of carpet and bag your mattress and that sort of stuff. But that's what I'd recommend is, you know, there are simple allergy tests available out there and talk to your doctor about being tested and then make sure you take action on it. Yeah. <clears throat> the environment in which we live, whether we smoke or work around dust, can affect our ability to breathe. Smoking is probably the number one reason why I see patients. Most of my patients have smoked, but there are situations where they've worked on a farm all their life and been exposed to that grain dust, have been exposed to asbestos, have been exposed to chemicals. In 2017, we've expanded to the, the plasmography so we can get all those different values that we normally wouldn't have done before. You have to have a booth to do plasmography. Nice and easy at the beginning. It's offering patients locally what they would normally would have had to drive to Sioux Falls to do before. Okay, and here we go. Big breath in. <sighs> blow it out. Blow, 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 blow. Keep going, keep going. Gotta keep pushing. Keep push, 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 push. Big breath in. Good. And relax. Perfect. Again, remember I told you that it has to be, um, when you give me maximum effort, the, your lungs will do the exact same thing. So what I'm doing now is I need you to do that every single time. And then I'm going to see that consistency, and then I know my results are good. Big breath in. Blast it out. Bull, bull, bull. Yeah, perfect. Keep going. Keep pushing. Keep pushing. Push, 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 push. Big breath in. Perfect. Just like that. That's what I'm looking for. But you see how these are now just basically tracing each other? That line there is perfectly tracing each other. This is the consistency. Now I know my results are going to be super consistent, and that's actually how your lungs look. Welcome back. We've got more questions, and I think we'll dive right into them, Mike. Let's do it. A maker, a male caller from Vermilion has bronchial disease from corn dust and farming. Mm -hmm. Four years since diagnosis, is it a progressive disease, or can you stabilize it? Yeah, so um, if it's truly chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis, um, which again would be a reaction to the exposure, removing the person from that exposure is the most important thing. Change so, jobs. Yeah, so if he's a farmer, ah. um, that's a tough situation. Yeah. And so the, the, the natural process of the disease is if you're continually exposed to the trigger, it will get worse with time. Um, and there are typical findings on CT scan and on breathing tests and sometimes a lung biopsy that can confirm exactly what it is. Yeah. But ultimately, if it's from the corn dust, he's got to avoid He's got to change. Dust. He, he needs to avoid corn yeah. dust, what do we... like the plague. Right, yep. A um, male from in his 60s states that three years ago, I got the upper right lobe of my lung removed due to cancer. I have now developed a spot on my kidney, which they want to remove because they believe it could be cancerous. Mm -hmm. There have been debate about whether or not they should put me under for surgery to remove this spot because I will be on a respirator and they do not know if I'll be able to be, right. be able to take an off the respirator after the surgery. My GP is not comfortable with me going under and I'm not comfortable with it either. Do you think this is something I should be concerned about? Mm -hmm. What are the steps I should take in making the decision to have surgery? Yeah, so there's almost no situation where I can't get a patient through a, a surgery with chronic lung disease, unless it's a surgery to remove parts of their lung and they right. don't have enough capacity. And so the, the first next step would be to make sure and have a breathing test and see you know, what's your lung function at baseline. And then if it's impaired, make sure you're on the right medicines to improve it and you go through pulmonary rehab and get as strong as you can. Um, and then I think, you know, if it's a necessary surgery, um, you know, there's some increased risk that he could remain on the ventilator for a longer period of time or have trouble getting off. But if it's needed, I think he probably can get tuned up and have it done. Well, and he's 60s. Yeah. I mean, he's got yeah. 
20 years to live. Yep, I think I, I would I, not rule it out. I, I would means. encourage the surgery, and I disagree with the GP yeah. or the family physician. Or yeah, the I mean, I've, I've had patients with the most severe lung disease sail through surgeries, and those with not as bad a lung disease have trouble. So it's not just based on that lung function. So there's, there's really never a time, um, you know, if it's a major heart surgery or something, then there are instances where yeah. it just can't be done. But for a kidney surgery, I, I think he could do it. You know, the drive to get better, the positive attitude about it makes a mm -hmm. ton of difference. And then you mentioned this earlier, and I think it's really worth emph uh, emphasizing, that a person's general condition, you know, their, that's called pulmonary rehab, but in, in, uh, overall it's general rehab. It's walking, it's, it's being involved, Absolutely. it's move your muscles. Your lungs want to be used, and so as a pulmonologist, more activity is better. Yeah. And that's just across the board. Across the board. The way it is. A female from uh, uh, Sioux Falls, a woman from Sioux Falls asks, can you explain the stages and percentages of CPD, COPD? Mm -hmm. Also, a uh, caller has COPD and cannot go outside in the summer due to humidity. Yeah. Would oxygen help this? Yeah, so oxygen alone doesn't usually alleviate the uh, shortness of breath associated with cold air exposure or humidity, but it can be helpful. And so the most important thing is to have a breathing test like we just demonstrated and see where you fall in that spectrum of disease, whether you're 80% and above, which is mild, whether you're 50 to 80% which is moderate, whether you're 30 to 50%, which is severe, or whether you're less than 30%, which is very severe. Yeah. And that allows us to then make sure you're on the right medicines, that you do the pulmonary rehab. Oxygen is indicated if you're sitting in my office and your saturation's 88% Eight. or lower, um, then oxygen is shown to be beneficial in that patient population. Or if when you sleep at night, you have 20 minutes of time where your oxygen is less than 88 or if when you walk your oxygen drops and we put you on oxygen and you say, wow, I feel so much better when I have this oxygen on. Um, but otherwise it's not helpful. Right. So they just need to see he, the pulmonologist he, or their doc. And, that 88% saturation or worse really does indicate oxygen. Yeah, it does. And, and I'll just say briefly, you know, everybody's got a pulse oximeter these days that has lung disease. Yeah. And, and they're always checking their number. And it, the number's not important to me nearly so much as their symptom. So sometimes my patient's number's 92, they're short of breath, put your oxygen on and if it helps you, great. And sometimes it's 82 and they feel fine. Um, if you're not having chest pain or some other indication for it, you don't have to panic in that set setting and be on oxygen. It's more about how you're feeling, not it, that number. Isn't that interesting? A Rapid City caller asks, do pesticides and fertilizers have an effect on the lungs? Yeah, certainly they can. Um, and, you know, can I say specifically which ones? No. Um, what I can say is try to avoid those things. Wear a mask when you're working with fertilizers. Wear gloves and protective equipment when you're working with pesticides um, because Long they're term. toxins. You just don't know. Yeah. And so it's best to protect yourself. So we've got not much time left and okay. a lot of questions. Okay. A caller from Canton asks, can COPD be cured by a lung transplant? Can, yep. Lung transplantation can cure COPD. I don't know if you want to say cure, but it's, if you're at the point where it's so severe and you're young enough and healthy enough to tolerate transplant, you should at least explore it. Yeah. Uh, do you end up with immunosuppressants? Yes. But are they, do they compromise your life and are they... Not like the they used to. You know, they used to be really hard on your kidneys or liver or, you know, suppress your immune system so you were sick all the time. They've done such a better job with the immune suppressant agents that, you know, lung transplant 20 years ago is, was sketchy at best. Now it's much better, so... Right. A Sioux Falls uh, person called, can you ever get off of CPAP? Um, Let's talk a lot about we'll, a little we'll, bit I'll, more. I'll be about brief, sleep but sleep apnea is extremely common. Um, at least 10% of our population uh, after the age of 50. And I think it's more than that. I think it is too. I think it's underreported, and it has to do with age and weight gain. Um, and so um, you can't do anything about getting older. That's the goal, right? Um, the alternative to that isn't good, uh, but weight gain can can be reversed. And so for every pound of weight you gain, the narrower your airway gets and the more likely you are to have sleep apnea. So if you can lose considerable weight, 10, 20% of your body weight. Your need for CPAP Your need away? for CPAP may go away. Yep, it may go away. So that's the most important thing you can do. But if, you know, I think you need to monitor it. And I think everybody 
wants an excuse not to do it because right. what is it? Thirty percent will use it, and the seventy yeah. percent it's underneath the bed. Yeah. Well, it, I I think my CPAP users do better job than that, and I think that's because of the way we manage them and and how I set them up for the uh, the. And your, your likelihood that they're going to be on a CPAP machine. You're, you're harsh and, and mean to right. them. Yeah. No, no, <laughs> no. I think it's all about support and 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 also recognizing the absolute benefits of CPAP. It's incredible what it. It's can wonderful do. benefits. It's wonderful benefits. A female from Faith asks, "Can you address how sleep apnea fits into breathing problems?" Yeah. So sleep apnea is a problem with the upper airway. It's not a lung disease. It's right. an upper airway disease. The true form of obstructive sleep apnea. We right. won't talk about central or complex That's apnea. That's a different ball game. But what happens is, as we get older, our tissues aren't as toned as they used to be. Things start Floppy. to sag. Yep. Things start to sag. And then we gain weight. Our neck gets larger. Our tongue gets bigger. Our soft palate gets larger and our airway gets smaller. And so then when we fall asleep, especially the deeper stages of sleep, the muscles relax and collapse. And so what happens in sleep apnea is your airway obstructs and you suffocate essentially until your brain shifts from that deepest sleep to lesser sleep. So all night long your sleep's being disrupted by your airway obstructing. CPAP is just positive airway pressure. It doesn't breathe for you. It's not oxygen blows air back in there and opens that airway up. You know, um, something like uh, three to five times higher death rate in people who have moderate to severe Absolutely. sleep apnea. It's a deadly disease. And when you treat it, what are the percentages? Reverses it. Yep, it brings it back to zero. And it's not a pill you have to take or a test you have to do. It's just a machine, you know, a little mask you put on and the nasal masks now are And small. they're better. They're way better. I've had, I can't tell you the number of patients who 15 years ago tried it and hated it and now they come back to me and say, I can't do it. And I say, yes, you can. I new know stuff. you can. Yep. There's new stuff. It's better than it's ever been. We'll make it happen. Um, and they, they get better. They do. Yep. Some don't. There's a very small percentage for me, I think. Well, not small, but. So I would strong, I mean, that's a huge message for tonight. If you are, uh, if you have a diagnosis of, of uh, sleep apnea, and you're struggling with CPAP, get back to it. Yeah. So what are the symptoms for sleep? S sleep apnea? Well, usually it's pretty obvious to the bed partner if someone's stopping breathing when they sleep or gasping for air. For the patient, it's vague. Sometimes it's just I'm tired or I'm, I'm fatigued. I'm tired all day or, long. Yep, I just don't have the energy I used to, and so it's worth if you fit the, you know the. The typical picture of sleep apnea, a large neck, more than 16 and a half in a man, 15 and a half in a woman, if your BMI is over 30, especially. But some, I've got skinny people with it too. Yeah. So um, if you're tired all the time, it's worth talking to your doc about it. I had a, a, a trucker uh, come in with his wife. You know, the, it's always good to have the wife along. Absolutely. And the wife was there, and he, he said, I'm doing fine, life is good. And she said, Would you tell him about how tired you are when you're driving? Well, I'm, I've been more and more tired, da da da. And I, she said, "Do you think he could have sleep apnea?" I made the brilliant diagnosis uh, yeah. right after that. It was. <laughs> yeah, I know. Most of the time, the patient can tell you what they have. A Rapid City caller states, "I have COPD and asthma, and I'm 75. I'm an on, on oxygen, and my oxygen levels vary greatly throughout the day. At times, plummeting quickly to 90 to 82. Mm -hmm. Most mornings, I can't." move or breathe when I wake up. How do I prevent these quick drops in oxygen that occur even just walking around the Yeah, house? and so that's the natural physiology of advanced COPD um, is the VQ mismatch. So um, it's normal for your oxygen level to drop when you have bad COPD if your body's oxygen requirements increase. Your right. lungs just can't even, keep up. Even if you're walking around. Even if you're walking around. So if you, you know, if you get sick, that increases your metabolic rate, you need more oxygen, your oxygen's gonna drop when you have COPD. Okay. Turn up your oxygen when you're active. It's just, that's really the only solution in that setting because Turn again, the it's the normal physiology of that disease. And the oxygen fixes it every time. If it doesn't, then there's something else that's going on. Okay. We've got, we, we, we need to be short in our okay. following questions. Right. A caller from Aberdeen states, I'm a former smoker with COPD. I'm large breasted and find that I have some breathing relief. If I lift my breasts, would a breast reduction procedure help with my troubles breathing? May very well. Yeah, yeah. I, I think so too. Yep. 
A Rapid City caller has been getting uh, blood transfusions due to low hemoglobin and sometimes end up gasping for air. Mm -hmm. Are transfusions the only treatment for low hemoglobin? No, certainly not. You know, I had a lady the other day referred to cardiology and pulmonology for shortness of breath and I checked her hemoglobin and it was eight and her MCE yeah. was 68 and her iron level was zero and so she needs iron. Yeah, she and so I gave iron. her iron and she's already better just with one IV infusion of iron and she'll get a second one. I, in a I had a similar case to that too. So iron or vitamin B12, those things. A Rapid City caller, what is the importance of using humidifiers in the winter? Do they actually help with respiratory health? They do. Yep, the air's dry and humidifying it helps. How much? Because you can get over zealous. Yeah, so I mean you like to be your house around 30 to 35 percent humidity and in the winter it's often 25. Okay. So just in the bedroom is often good enough. Keeps I the air had, humidified at night. I had people going up to 60. Oh no, yeah, then you get too much moisture and mold. And all all those uh, uh, bed, what are, you know, dust mites. Yeah, they love trouble. that. A woman from who's 61 watching from California. All right. Uh, as a child in South Dakota, she was diagnosed with what is known today as Samter's triad, which, which is asthma, nasal polyps, aspirin sensitivity. Mm -hmm. As she ages, could this history make her more susceptible to COPD or any other pulmonary disease? Yeah, so you've heard of it before too. Um, it's, it's not uncommon in asthmatic patients to have nasal polyps and aspirin sensitivity. Yes. And it's just about managing the disease. And so avoiding aspirin, of course, NSAIDs and aspirin. No more aspirin, right? no and more then, ibuprofen, and then no more aspirin. Being on your inhaled steroid, Elite. yep, and, and singular or antihistamine or whatever it takes. But if she manages her asthma, she won't um, develop it. But she's at increased risk as compared to somebody who doesn't. Okay. What exercises can you do to improve lung function? I love that question. Specifically, what would it be? Just walk, be active. You know, using an incentive spirometer or taking big breaths aren't as important as just moving. Work in the garden. Yeah, be active. Mow the lawn when you can. Walk up the flight of steps instead of taking the elevator. There you go. A caller from Brookings asks, what eosinophilic pneumonia is it related and what is it related to asthma um, it's not necessarily so you can have a separate disease acute eosinophilic pneumonia different than chronic eosinophilic pneumonia there's a disease known as Schurg Strauss which is an eosinophilic yeah. granuloma that's a vasculitis so they're different than asthma similar in their disease pathology but different um, and so uh, it's just important that you make sure your doctor understands what it is that you have okay so 20 seconds Take home message. Um, I think if you're having breathing problems um, and you haven't seen a pulmonologist and you're not satisfied with where you're at, um, ask your doctor to get you to someone um, who specializes in the lungs. Um, you know, there's pulmonologists in Yankton and Sioux Falls and Watertown and Aberdeen. And Rapid City. And Rapid City. So, so. Well, it's such a great pleasure to have you here. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. And now for the winner of tonight's Prairie Doc quiz question, true or false? The risk of bacterial pneumonia can quickly and effectively be reduced by getting a vi viral flu vaccine. True or false, Mike? That's obviously true. Um, we know that having the flu greatly increases your risk for a secondary bacterial infection that can be much more serious than if you didn't ever get the flu. So getting the flu vaccine it is very important. That. Yeah. It was Barbara Statenroth from Aberdeen who answered the question correctly. Thank you, Barbara, for participating, and a book will be in the mail to you soon. We'll be right back after this. Welcome to your Prairie Doc Library at www.prairiedoc.org. Wherever you live or travel, you and your family can enjoy free and easy access 24 hours a day. Search for a specific topic. Browse through the television shows, radio programs, and blog page. You, your family, and friends around the world can learn from physicians and other health professionals answering questions on a variety of medical topics. Visit your Prairie Doc Library today at www.prairiedoc.org. It's a holy time when a patient is taking their last breath. For the most part, I've tried my best to give comfort at that time. There are many who have stated there are worse things than death. One study in 2016 asked end-stage patients about dying and found that more than 67% stated that needing a breathing machine was a condition worse than death. Mr. B was an 
84-year-old retired farmer who had been struggling with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or COPD. This condition is related to the loss of ability to exhale normally, which in turn is due to the destruction of tiny alveoli, which are oxygen and carbon dioxide exchange units. This results in large, unfunctional pockets of air, which block the flow of air going out. He had smoked and had extensive exposure to toxic farm dust throughout his life, and now he was on continuous oxygen therapy and couldn't do anything without running out of breath. He had been on pulmonary rehabilitation or exercises to stay in shape, a low carbohydrate diet, meter dose inhaler bronchodilators, and repeated antibiotics during his last years. This was the third time he was hospitalized in the last two months for exacerbation of COPD. He was in the hospital again with worsening of his lung disease and with the added challenge of bacterial pneumonia. His oxygen levels were dropping and survival was going to require a breathing machine or intubation again. He had been intubated over several days during the previous hospitalization and this time he did not want it. His wife had died a year earlier, all siblings had passed away, but his only child, a son, lived nearby. I will never forget the conversation the three of us had that day. We talked about Mr. B's poor quality of life. His options were either to be intubated again or to go with comfort care using an opioid. Mr. B realized death was likely, as did the son. Mr. B said, let's try the comfort method. His anxiety and shortness of breath were improved immediately after making that choice. And over the next two hours, as the pain medicines kicked in, Mr. B slipped away while his son was at his side. This is very serious business. And I usually encourage people who are aware of their situation to fight on. But Mr. B was very tired of fighting for breath. He was ready to let go. In this case, needing a breathing machine was a condition worse than death. After his last breath, he finally found relief. Well, a great big thank you to our guest, Michael, for volunteering to come to our studio. We're paying him the big bucks, you know, nothing. <laughs> and add his experience and knowledge to our discussion tonight. If you'd like more information about this program or see more episodes, please like and follow us on Facebook or visit us at prairiedoc.org. According to the South Dakota Department of Health, 16% of all clinic vi visits last week were for flu-like illnesses. For children four years and younger, it was 26%. We have already equaled last year's number of deaths at 43, and we still have months to go in South Dakota. Get your flu shot. It's important not just for you, but to help protect those babies who are susceptible, people who are on chemotherapy or on drugs that are, and older. So, well, that does it for tonight. From all of us here at On Call with the Prairie Doc, our skin takes a lot of abuse as it protects us from the outside world. What happens when it has problems? Lumps, bumps, and barnacles. What's growing on my skin? Next time, On Call with the Prairie Doc. On Call with the Prairie Doc is very important to a lot of people uh, in this area and in this region because it communicates a lot of very valuable information on health care. This project takes dollars. 
We have a great foundation called the Healing Words Foundation that oversees this whole operation and is responsible for some of the fundraising to promote these programs. So the website is prairiedoc.org, O-R-G, prairiedoc.org. Go there, donate if you're so inclined, and we thank you very much. Major funding for On Call with the Prairie Doc has been provided by... Avera is a proud sponsor of On Call with the Prairie Doc on South Dakota Public Broadcasting. Larson Manufacturing is proud to support On Call with the Prairie Doc as it continues to open doors for important medical information. And with the ongoing support of these individuals and institutions, South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care, Brookings Health System, Ophthalmology Limited, Avera Heart Hospital, Dakota Allergy and Asthma, Fishback Financial Corporation, Vance Thompson Vision, Urology Specialists, Brown Clinic, American Academy of Family Physicians Foundation and South Dakota Academy of Family Physicians, Black Hills Medical Society, Aberdeen District Medical Society, Flandreau Madison Brookings District Medical Society, Sioux Falls District Medical Society, Yankton District Medical Society, Dakota Bank, Orthopedic Institute, Physicians Care Sanford Clinic Community Service Committee, Aberdeen Asthma and Allergy, and Swift Tail Communications. <laughs>